All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining tonight. For me tonight, it's 8 p.m. in British Columbia in Turtle Island. And um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in today in our um, January 19 session with uh, Victor Jimenez. Oh, your slide disappeared. There it is. With Victor Jimenez's presentation, before we start, and to start us in a good way, I want to share that I am joining this uh, seminar. It's an international seminar. We join from many parts of the world, but I am joining from um, Turtle Island, as I said before, uh, the unceded and never surrendered lands of the to Kamloops, to Chukwetmek in Chukwetmek Uluk, in what we know today as British Columbia, Canada, Kamloops, British Columbia, Canada. And I want to give honor and acknowledgement to the original stewards of this land, the Shikwetmi peoples, and just um, remind us uh, that much of the work that we do in this, much the work that we do in this sessions and this seminar is... Um, working towards decolonizing knowledge, decolonizing our institutions and the, the world we live in steeped in colonial violence and reminding us that that is the case and we need to do so much work to um, decolonize our work, ourselves, the institutions, our societies. And today we have a presentation by Victor Jimenez Rivera, who is a PhD student in Tallinn University, and he will be presenting on his paper, Decolonizing Knowledge Production. As you can see the title on your screens, a critical look at knowledge production in the Europeanization narrative in European integration. So please um, join me in welcoming Victor and this presentation. Go right ahead, Victor. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Monica. So, yeah, I will be talking about uh, my upcoming um, research on, on this very topic. Uh, so I, I focus on um, decolonizing uh, knowledge production in the narrative um, of European integration. Um, during my uh, doctoral studies at Tallinn University, and I will be presenting this in a, a bit of a discussion format. So um, the plan for today is I'll present my um, research problem and the approach that I'm taking at um, studying it. And then uh, we can have some discussion and um, of course any uh, feedback that you might have uh, would be very helpful. So it is more than welcome. So I will uh, dive right in with the um, research problem um, that um, that informed me in in undertaking my research. Uh, so the main thing that I uh, that I want to study is to problematize the uh, hegemonic Europeanization narrative as a neo-colonial imposition on mostly um, Eastern European societies, but um, other uh, peripheral societies in in the European neighborhood as well. So the uh, process of European integration, as I see it, has been based on a uh, hegemonic narrative uh, that has been developed around uh, an unequal understanding of what uh, European norms and values are and um, if there should even be such a thing. And this uh, is a paradigm that stems from a long history of um, unilateral definitions by core, uh, mostly Western European actors of what and who is um, European. And that's uh, which norms and values uh, political entities must uphold to be admitted into this um, in-group of uh, European societies enjoying the benefits of European integration as a project. 
and uh, this has resulted in the unequal development of the uh, European institutional project. I mostly focus on the European Union, but of course, um, the same applies to all of the European institutions that have developed since um, mostly since World War II, but uh, particularly since the end of um, the so-called Cold War. And the orientation of this project towards uh, benefiting the interests of uh, its Western European core, and in particular, those of its ruling uh, capitalist class. And how this, um, um, what I problematize is how this uh, has been channeled through the European Union, the institutional setup and the norms and values that it aims to uphold in this uh, hegemonic narrative. Uh, so... Uh, tying it uh, with the um, uh, with the goal of our meetings as well, I explore the use of this hegemonic narrative from a relational perspective as well. So the interests and values that I mentioned that are reflected in the European narrative, um, just as these uh, Western European core actors that enact them are, in my view, not fixed and static, but uh, rather are constantly changing. So this is an aspect that I problematize as well in a lot of the documentation on the Europeanization process and on the uh, process of European integration in general. Uh, I see a lot of substantialist na uh, language essentializing especially the um, so-called target societies of European integration and this is a core issue that I study, and I'll get back to that a little bit later as well. But the emergence of this uh, narrative of Europeanization, of becoming a European, uh, serves to consolidate an understanding of the relationship at large between these core and peripheral actors. Uh, and this is used to legitimize an asymmetrical distribution of power and agency, uh, which are, of course, interrelated uh, concepts within the relationship in favor of these um, Western actors uh, that have, through historical and material means, uh, gained a dominant position. And thus, uh, they gain uh material incentives to exploit their counterparts and solidify their position within these relations um so i view this um this narrative of becoming uh, becoming european of uh, europeanizing as a key aspect in legitimizing these inherently unequal power relations and presenting them as a uh, inherently good development to these uh, so-called target uh, societies. So I look also at, um, at othering and epistemic violence as key aspects that are inherent to this process. So due to these um, structural factors that I mentioned that shape the relations between these um, core and peripheral actors in uh, European integration, uh, this, uh, the former these core actors have gained enhanced uh, agency due to the material as uh, advantages that I mentioned, uh, which they use to impose their what they perceive to be uh, their norms and values, and thus to silence and essentialize their peripheral counterparts. So uh, in this aspect, I am informed by Edward Said's uh, views, and I present in my paper that uh, marginalized uh, voices in this process are presented as unchanging uh, um, unidimensional monolithical essences, which are passively receiving the hegemonic norms and values, and which accept them as inherently beneficial for them. Uh, this is, of course, colonial in nature, and it follows from an Orientalist tradition that views Western societies as uh, dynamic, creative, enlightened, democratic, pluralistic, and so on. 
and presents their counterparts. And as I mentioned, particularly in Eastern Europe, although Southern Europe is also a target sometimes as static, uh, backwards, authoritarian, monolithic, etc. So this um, epistemic violence does is the result of these um, ordering mechanisms that I present as it privileges these uh, core Western norms and values that I mentioned and utilizes them to solidify uh, these um, unequal power relations. Uh, so I draw here from um, Spivak's definition of um, epistemic violence. Uh, she describes it as the um, remotely orchestrated far-flung and heterogeneous project to constitute the colonial subject as other. I think that this applies to the Europeanization narrative as these processes are mostly dictated from Brussels and present um, and these um, target societies as essentially monolithic, both internally and, um, and between them, seeing most of them as essentially being in the same position of needing to adopt uh, European norms and values to modernize, to develop, to become uh, European, ignoring the material uh, differences between them. So knowledge production, which is uh, what we are discussing today, is uh, crucial as uh, both um, both the core and the peripheral elites uh, with a hegemonic narrative that enables them to speak about the marginalized to speak on behalf of the marginalized and secure their privileged position through epistemic violence. So I, I uh, problematize as well the simplistic uh, view of um, just um, Western European versus Eastern European uh, societies, but I also see that um, within the, um, the Eastern European societies, the elites as well are uh, partake in the spreading of this narrative as it legitimizes uh, their own position as well. Uh, so I aim to connect uh, these views that I presented here also to a uh, world systems analysis view. And I understand knowledge production as a critical aspect in uh, the legitimation of the complex division of labor that is inherent to the capitalist world system. So by opening borders, uh, to the to the open flows of capital in societies that are uh, uh, that are at the other end of this unequal power relation, this um, this of course benefits the their exploitation, and I problematize this uh, this mutually beneficial European narrative as a means to to legitimize these power relations. So these uh, processes uh, that I discussed then in my view um, result in what I call the uh, main contradictions of European integration, uh, which are the um, resulting state capture and entrenchment from interconnected political and economic elites in the, um, uh, in the so-called um, target um, societies and the entrenchment of um, what is termed as um, stabilocratic regimes or so autocratic regimes uh, that are stable and deeply entrenched. Uh, and I see these as a result of these um, state-centric approach in European integration, uh, whereby integrating um, a state into these uh, institutional frameworks is the goal and not the actual uh, democratization of, of societies. Um, so these processes, in my view, disregard uh, local agency, both in the peripheral and in the core societies, but my uh, main focus is in the, um, in the peripheral societies. And the process is deeply undemocratic, even when viewed through this hegemonic narrative, as I mentioned. 
and I I see in my uh, literature review as well that uh, most of the current approaches uh, fail to state the importance of knowledge production in the legitimation and infringement of these unequal relations. Uh, they the hegemonic narrative tends to be taken for granted in many approaches, and even when it isn't, uh, most of the approaches are focused on institutionalized processes and on state actors rather than um rather than uh, going deeper in the um, relations that underlie them so i will now move on to the goals of my research um, process so here i aim to study the link between um, european integration and the resulting state capture and the other processes that I uh, that I mentioned before in these peripheral con uh, countries and societies, and so this um, European narrative is then the the main focus of my study and uh, the knowledge creation that goes with it. And I problematize the um, the taken for granted hegemonic uh, narrative um, with. Um, uh, an approach that I, that I aim to be radical and relational. Um, this I uh, this will be done by understanding these relations as as colonial, and studying the contradiction between the simultaneous processes that I discussed before as a um, wicked problem. Uh, and the which I'll get back to uh, later as well. Uh, but the main focus um, here uh, is on EU integration in the Western Balkan societies, in particular, as, uh, as my main case study. These processes that I see uh, develop throughout the European Union's neighborhood and even some of its member states' societies. But I aim to emphasize the process on these uh, societies as my main case study with the um, unit of analysis being the relations at uh, multiple levels of uh, governance and society and institutions that uh, underlie these uh, simultaneous processes that, that I discussed of um, both um, European integration and also um, state capture in these societies and I aim to do this adopting a radical relational approach uh, to view these um, relations as um, dynamic and continuously unfolding processes. And the aim, um, the aim that I want to, to have with my research proce uh, project eventually, uh, not just with this paper, but uh, with my entire um, dissertation as a whole, is to propose a governance approach that is focused on amplifying local agency. And for this, uh, I aim to do this by de-emphasizing the, the role of state actors, which um, while acknowledging that they are important as decision makers, I, I focus on understanding these relations as uh, something uh, more and acknowledging the uh, the role and the agency that um, that other actors uh, play and so I understand uh, these relations as um, as I said as uh, being deeply unequal due to the status of uh, one end of the relation due to uh, both material and uh, ideational aspects as peripheral and exploited by the core, um, which is able to impose this uh, hegemonic narrative that I uh, problematize and to use it to govern uh, their relations and solidifying this power imbalance, uh, which uh, results inevitably then in the uh, othering and essentializing of these marginalized and um, these um, oppositional voices, which are seen as as I said before, is unchanging and uh, monolithical essences, which uh, are expected to passively receive the norms and policies 
of the of the core and and how this um, narrative is used to justify the, and legitimize the imposition of top down conditionality and measures by the EU and its institutional framework on its candidates and um, thus being able to reshape their societies in its own image for its own benefit. And uh, therefore, in my in my approach, I aim to um, democratize inputs and uh, de-emphasize the prevalence of uh, state actors in in these relations and bring the experiences of the marginalized local actors to to the forefront of my research. Um, so now I'll move on to the uh, methods that I aim to use. So as I mentioned, the, um, one of the main uh, ways that I aim to study this problem is through um, case studies of, uh, um, of societies undergoing these processes. Um, but I aim to uh, first use um, discourse analysis to um, essentially, as I call it in the slide, to diagnose the problem. So that is as uh, so as as you could have seen from my previous slides, that is the part of my research that is uh, most uh, developed, so to speak, at the moment. Um, so with this uh, with this analysis of the of the discourse of um, Europeanization of the creation and imposition of this hegemonic narrative, um. I aim to problematize uh, this hegemonic discourse that is often, as I said before, taken for granted uh, both in uh, popular conscience, but also in a lot of uh, research on Europeanization and on um, European integration at large. And with this, I aim to establish the coloniality of the current relations between the European uh, core and its periphery, uh, both, um, as I said before, in an inter-societal um, and intra-societal way, if uh, there can be such a thing as um, inter-societal relations, of course. Um, and uh, to see the um, EU's course nor core uh, the EU course uh, apologies uh, norms and values of uh, capitalism globalization uh, modernity development uh, Europeanness as the discursive legitimation for the imposition of these uh, material inequalities and and it is these material inequalities that I want to highlight in my research too as the policies that are uh, legitimized by this Europeanization narrative uh, have a very real effect in um, both solidifying and deepening these unequal relations as through uh, through policies such as the open borders uh, policies, the, um, the visa liberalization policies and so on. Um, unequal capital flows are are enabled to develop, uh, which leads, as I said, in deeper inequality both um, within uh, within societies themselves, as the legitimation of the ruling elites and its entrenchment in power is a very important aspect of these relations. But also um, with the uh, between the uh, between the uh, peripheral societies and the core societies, which are, of course, deeply interrelated and become more so with uh, the processes of European integration. Uh, and as I said before, um, uh, more more feedback is welcome to uh, take this um, take this research further. Uh, so uh, in the discussion part, do feel free to to share your ideas. Um, but now I would like to end with the uh, findings and uh, conclusions that my paper has reached uh, thus far. So 
as I said in the previous slide, the uh, the part of my research that has, uh, that is most developed so far has been this analysis of the discourse in this hegemonic narrative, and which I found that uh, not to repeat myself too much, but uh, that the language uh, that is used in this hegemonic narrative is highly. Uh, colonial in, in nature and highly uh, centralizing and, uh, and, and substantialist uh, as it presents uh, the it presents the candidate states uh, to the European Union as societies um, that both deeply want and that are deeply in need of uh, so-called uh, modernization and development in uh, Western European terms, and how this ignores the uh, material inequalities that um, that prevent, uh, so to speak, these societies even when viewed within the the norms and values and understanding on core, that prevents them from being at, uh, so to speak, in, uh, in very plain terms, at the same um, level. As, as they are economically and uh, politically. So I have found then that this hegemonic narrative um, both legitimizes and also reinforces and solidifies these unequal relations. And this leads, um, and I put it here in um, rather simple terms, uh, in uh, Western European core elites and also local elites in um, Eastern European societies to uh, materially and ideationally benefit from uh, these processes. And uh, as well as the role of uh, knowledge production being um, that uh, it enables the framing of uh, these peripheral societies in essentialist colonial language. So they are presented, uh, as I said earlier, as um, authoritarian um, backward um, societies that are in need of um, help from uh, the Western European core in order to develop and democratize, uh, even though, uh, in fact, um, the the main reason uh preventing them from democratizing even in core terms um is the presence of these um, deeply unequal relations between them and uh, uh core actors imposing their uh, norms and values on them and it is uh, this imposition of western norms and values that is uh, taken for granted within this narrative of uh, development, integration, and modernity, and so on. That is uh, is both the deep, uh, both uh, deeply ingrained and entrenched, and uh, also essentially uh, taken for granted. So that would be it uh, for um, my um, for my talk for now. But I would. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for listening uh, to me talk for this uh, half an hour. And I would like to invite, of course, everyone to to discuss and um, any any feedback is welcome, of course. And I'm looking forward to, to discussing these issues with everyone. All right. Thank you so much, Victor, for a really interesting, uh, thought-provoking presentation. I will start taking comments. Um, anybody who would like to start letting us know if you have anything to um, comment, discuss about the presentation. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. I see your hand up. Happy to go on the line if there are other people who have things that they would like to have anything oh, else that to say. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead and we'll we'll keep thinking because I also have but my thoughts are a bit uh, dispersed. So it would be great if you can <laughs> take the lead. Thank you so much, Victor. You have um 
really strongly conceptualized your project and articulated it in a really compelling way. Um, I just have a couple of questions. I might just start with this very, very specific one. Um, because it's something that I've battled with a lot myself. Um, so first of all, just a technical question. This might be for the big, broader PhD project than for the specific one. But can you tell me a little bit more about what exact relations are you exploring? How? What's the actual... How are you conceptualizing that? Like, are you, because I think it's really, really hard work. I think it's really, really hard work and I don't know the answer. So I'm, I'm here to learn more. Like, are you speaking with policy people? I know in this, in this presentation, you've sort of inferred like a discourse analysis of policy papers or positionings or maybe some official institutional, um, um, but I want to get a little bit more into the heart of what relational, radical relational research might be and how we understand those relations. Because when I listen to this presentation, and this might just be this paper, and you might be doing something different for the actual PhD, but when I listen to this paper, I could kind of hear like a like a, a critical theory PhD, I could hear, and I could hear Foucault coming through in some of the ways you were speaking. Um, but obviously when Foucault, and, and Foucault is, is leaned into a lot in radical relational thinking, when we think about power, when we think about force, but for Foucault, that, there's always this contestation happening. And so I just want to get a sense of like one way you could do this is like a discourse analysis, critical discourse analysis of European Union policies and their imposition on peripheral states. And maybe we need to, maybe that language, we can slip into the language of the dominant as well. Like how, to, how you know, how do we use this, the language? But, you know, and the sort of marginalized communities you're talking about, the marginalized states, how are you actually researching the relations? Like how are you actually understanding their conceptualization and responses? Like how do you actually raise that voice? And, and how do we think about ways relation, multiple ways relationships are understood backwards and forwards? Don't know. Yeah, so it might be something you're looking at in the broader PhD, but it'd be great to dig down a little bit deeper because I struggle with this myself. Like I want to use relations as the unit of analysis, but how do there's so many ways we can get into that? So I'm really interested to hear a bit more of the dig down deep into that, what that means, and what is it you're actually analyzing? Because like a document is not a relation sense like mm. this is something that I kind of struggle with so I'm keen for everyone's thoughts but particularly how you're kind of wrestling with it Victor thank you yes thank you for the comments Rebecca and I I will say that uh, this is one of the things that I have uh, struggled the most in conceptualizing my my paper so definitely that's one of the that's one of the main issues so at the um, at the spot that I am at at the moment, I am mostly focusing on institutional relations as I expect this to sort of lay the lay the groundwork for then the deeper approach in the in the rest of my um, doctoral studies. Uh, so uh, the way that I conceptualize the the relations at the, um, at this at this point in time is I'm looking at the the, the institutionalized, aspects of the relation so so maybe the unit of analysis in this sense is not the relation as as a whole right but it's more the the institutionalized aspects of it um but what i hope and what i expect 
is that um, understanding this uh, narrative, understanding the way that this relationship is institutionalized um, between these, I, I don't like uh, using these terms uh, between the societies because there is no, no such thing as a separate societies, right? As we'd be leaning into this, um, we'd be leaning into this hegemonic understanding. Mm. But but what I hope to do with this with this paper, as it's sort of my um, my first um, uh, my first paper, so, so to speak, is to to lay the the groundwork in understanding. Uh, so what I'm focusing more at this point is understanding how these core actors. Um, uh, in as much as we can speak of such a thing as um, as core actors as such uh how they uh, uh, how they consolidate this uh, position of um, mm -hmm. relative power that they have gained uh, mostly materially um how they consolidate this and use it to weave a hegemonic narrative that they can then impose on these uh, societies mm -hmm. that they are interested in uh, up to these um capital flows and and so on yeah, um, it's so brilliant. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, your paper, I, I loved it. I loved it. I love this kind of conceptual work you're doing. But I guess I just feel as a fellow journey person, and I think we're all reckoning with this in some yeah. ways. How do we, like a lot of like Ben and Birgit's work, like, um, like states themselves are so identified in how we conceptualize them. The European Union is identified. How do we do this and how do we make space for contestations within groups and between them? Like how do we enable that kind of bring those, bring that to the fore? I don't know the answer, but I'm really looking forward to learning more. Please come back and present again as you move through this because it is really hard work when you keep getting sucked back to wanting to lay claim to name in a particular way, which has its own issues if we're appealing to like a decolonial logic that as soon as we name, we lay claim and that being very much a, a kind of an inheritance of Western thought. So um, really here, yeah, I'm looking forward to learn more as you journey along, learn from you as you try and wrestle with some of these enormous issues. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay. It's, um, I think you've put your finger there in something that I would, as you were going on, sorry, and I have my hand up here. <laughs> so I put myself in the speakers list. Uh, but please raise your hand so that the next person uh, can start speaking um, after my comments, because I was listening to you and I'm like, yeah, agreeing completely. This is how um, the whole narrative of European superiority gets created and imposed, but also the narrative has this kind of inherent built in uh, uh, colonial imposition that also exploits. And so it's like you're showing, you're being shown your place and therefore you're not allowed in with us, the superiors kind of thing. And it's this narrative that we've been fed throughout the colonial order in which we're all kind of grappling with and figuring out how to unentangle and unentangle ourselves from that kind of uh, mentality. It made me also think about the uh, decolonial thinkers, the South Americans. Mignolo speaks about the and and Dussel as well, Enrique Dussel, um, about the intramural colonial difference because they they speak about the extramural one in which there's racialization, right? Of the other, even the states, the whole states get racialized. But there's also an intramural difference within Europe where the core, as you call them, and following, I suppose, Wallerstein's uh, um, uh, terminology, the core countries uh, uh, conceptualizes themselves being 
disappear and then the intramural difference of those that are aspiring to be part of and be given the elements for development and all the things all the goodies that um in reality the european powers have because they uh colonized and exploited the rest of the world and that's why they have those goodies but they also there's it's also framed as if the goodies are part of um what you can also aspire to if you follow this kind of linear uh path that we followed without looking at all the dispossession and exploitation and and um even enslavement and 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 marginalization that took place in that process so so if we're going to be and again it's it's grappling with how do we um uh present these in a relation, in a radical relational way, uh, with radical relational methodologies, where what we're centering are those relations. And I think one key there, and I'd like you to talk a little bit more to this, is that local agency that you're talking about. And and perhaps maybe this is part of the rest of your uh, doctoral uh, work, but this governance approach that you mentioned that amplifies local agency i think may be uh, key in this and it, it it kind of links there with uh, what what mignolo calls um uh cosmopolitan uh pluriversal localisms or something to that effect where where it's the localism but but the cosmopolitanism is not like a unifying force like the the the, the, the european colonial uh, aspiration but it's more like a like an opening for the for the different ways of uh, knowing and being, and here again, with that local agency, perhaps you can give us a little bit of of connection to um, knowledge production, and that's the bit that I'm missing from what you discussed today. How does it connect to knowledge production, and if there is any method or way and again i don't have an answer but 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 here we are trying to build the answers together um what method do we use um to allow for that local agency to to come to the fore um and 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 create the possibility for that uh radical relational i don't know dialogue engagement i wonder what you would um yeah and that we don't sort of homogenize how we imagine yeah 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 that's the aspect that i am that i'm uh, grappling with as well so this as uh, as you alluded to uh is is something that i have planned for um for uh, deeper into my in, into my studies as i i do not um yet at the moment have a definite answer on, on actually how i want to conceptualize this and i think that is uh part of why i started with uh with trying to to first understand um how this um how this narrative um, is, is operationalized and how it is uh, conceptualized and how it operates uh, in a sense to to legitimize these um, um, these uh, political and economic relations at the institutional level and then as as you said the goal is to develop an approach that does take into account the local agency and that does uh, in essence respond to what uh what the people on the ground so to speak actually um actually actually not necessarily expect i'm trying to find the, the specific word that i would use because of course we also need to understand that the the wishes and wants of people on the ground have also been in in essence um uh colon uh, colonized by this narrative uh, a lot of um mm -hmm. a lot of people who aim to speak on behalf of the colonized also do so uh using the colonial language themselves and even uh with good intentions right we see this a lot 
they the actions that they take do nothing but uh, perpetuate these unequal relations so that is something that uh, needs um, needs a lot of thought and consideration and that's why i don't have a, a specific answer at the moment but uh, essentially, my aim would be to develop um, a, a governance approach that, that does take a more local um, centric approach rather than the um, state institutional centric approaches that have been the norm so far. Uh, so that's as much as I as I have uh, conceptualized this far, but. But yeah, I want to understand how then uh, how then we can conceptualize how local agency, how uh, how the so to speak um, recipients of all of these policies can actually talk back uh, because this is something that um, in most of the both academic literature and of course institutionalized the processes is not really taken into account more than at the lip service level. There's a lot of references in the institutional um, discourse in the in the institutionalized uh, fora on how local agency is taken into account and how discussions are made with local actors, but then the resulting uh, actual policies, to my understanding, tend to, for the most part, to actually disregard those findings. So that is um, that is an aspect that I am that I am uh, that I'm grappling with to to actually develop how to how to, how to bring this about. Right, Ben. Yes, thank you. Uh... I also don't really have a question. <laughs> um, just wanted to also say, Victor, this all sounds really good already. You're definitely going places and exploring, you know, uh, asking really good questions. Um, I just like jumping in the discussion that was happening. I had kind of two, two remarks, maybe. Um, the first one is really about uh, talking to the local actors. Um, so what Birgit and I were always saying, like, um, it, it matters who you're thinking with and like kind of uh, which worlds that we actually can create or which worlds can be seen or, you know, kind of unmasked and things like this. So it is, uh, I think, really, really important to go into the you know, periphery as yes, maybe to use your language a little bit and like think with them about the, this Europeanization process and, um, you know, how are the colonial, how's the colonial discourse kind of seen from there and so I think that's really important. And of course, uh, I know that this is also your plan. <laughs> uh, but just to echo this a bit, that, you know, radical relationalism has this idea and uh, also has this, you know, kind of, at least in our project here, that we are we are thinking about radical relationalizing as this, you know, transformative, um, you know, or chance of transformative action in a way that if you do this, maybe you can you can make this whole process better hopefully or something like this and then just a thought on the on the governance aspect is um um you know we just the governance of the of wicked problems you also mentioned wicked problems in your uh in your presentation there is this uh uh yeah it's it's getting very complicated of course <laughs> also what what you're trying to do i wonder actually now what is this wicked problem is it the uh, Europeanization process is it the you know integration itself and uh, maybe you can you can kind of uh, talk to that for a second. Um, but what we have seen is that uh, there needs to be this kind of holistic approach to to govern them. It's very 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 hard to keep the state out of it. Um, <laughs> oft, often there is there seems to be not enough uh, yeah power or authority or legitimacy to uh, to do any of these actions but maybe it would be interesting to to hear your you know what does this wicked problem actually look like that you were describing here yeah so uh yeah so definitely uh well first of all thanks for the thanks for the comments and um, and yeah, definitely the state cannot uh, cannot be ignored, of course, as the um, as the focus of 
a lot of the the social organization and a lot of the organization of of power that uh, that we're discussing here and essentially the the way that i would uh, conceptualize the uh, the wicked uh, problem that that i'm focusing on is the the entrenchment of these unequal relations as as a whole so so to me the to me the main problem that i'm that i'm seeing here is that um you know in spite of these uh so in spite of these um aim of of most people in these uh, colonized societies to um uh, how to say to uh in the terms of the at least in the terms of uh the hegemonic narrative for lack of uh for lack of better terms uh to to develop their societies and to essentially yeah, better their material conditions right by partaking in these processes uh, their uh, their material situation does get uh, does get worse in this sense so that's the um that that i guess is the main uh, the main aspect of the wicked problem um here that that i would see but um but yeah, I'm not sure if uh, if if that's very uh, clearly conceptualized at uh, at this stage either. The yeah, when I this is really interesting because when I hear about the 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 the, the issues that you're grappling with, they're really they're really big. Like, like it's like we live under capitalism, and that already is a wicked problem, <laughs> right? Um, the narratives within which we live, like even state itself, like Ben says, is 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 almost inescapable. Is that source of uh, institutions and policies, and um, and in in even then, state is a bit of a an abstract thing. Because we have governments and we have people in governments and all the levels and all that, but and the policies and the rules and but when you speak about state, it's um, it's a, it's 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 essentializing in a way something that is not necessarily even even there. It's a bunch of relations really, so that could be that could be you know a way to to approach it or to see it because it's it's. It's a it's it's a European invention, really, and then it's exported through colonial um, exploits throughout the world in many different ways. But now, now is like here and so hard to get away from it, as as is capitalism, as is the embedded white supremacy in capitalism. So um, perhaps what we're talking about when we look at wicked problems in this group is 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 perhaps the same beast but we're looking at it from different perspectives i don't know maybe it's a perspectival thing that we're grappling with yeah. rebecca yeah, thank you just like oh, to sorry. Add, uh, the, yeah. uh, sorry uh uh sorry rebecca i would just like to add a comment to this that i'm sure that is one of the aspect that I am uh, grappling with the most as well to the uh, so before I can decolonize anything else I need to decolonize my own thoughts right because I noticed that uh, you, you know when I conceptualize my research and I'm sure I'm not the I'm not the only one I keep coming back to these essentialist um, uh, colonial concepts of um, the state the the society you know what all of these uh, um what all of, all of this actually means, which is so deeply ingrained that uh, sometimes it actually mm -hmm. it takes active effort to. Yeah, definitely. Oh, Rebecca. Yeah, I'm just wondering, I was going to share with you, Victor, there's a conversation that, that that's bubbling around in this group, I feel, and it's about verbs and nouns. And I feel feel like even a problem is like a noun 
And we need to make space for things to be constantly moving. And I was just listening to you talk and you're using this word entrench. And I just wonder about like if we want to be processual and verbing things can help sometimes. Like are you researching at this point the process of entrenching and you're looking at the ways that the relations are playing out in that process of trying to entrench? entrenching um it's the same with the problem and I know um, Ben and I've talked about this before but who names a problem when does it become a problem for whom is it a problem and it who gets to name a problem and when do they get to do that and under what conditions so it's sort of like um yeah so two things I guess that's one that's been really helpful for me is always trying to turn the thing into a verb and see what happens when I when I um try to think of it, try and really um embody movement. Because that allows, like say entrenching, that allows you to see push who tries to move it in what direction at what time and who pushes where. You know, how is that working and what relations come into play at different points in that process? Because um, I think that can be really interesting um, on the way through. But that's just a little combo that's been kind of bubbling as a way of troubling, like to kind of embody that becoming. Like how do we actually not impose a substantialism? Like this is a problem as in this cannot be solved or can only be solved with X number of force, but rather maybe going back to that con con ongoing contestation. Like maybe this contestation has been around way before the European Union. Maybe you, it's just being constructed in this way at this point in time. So what things are bearing down on it, acting on it, or what's acting upon it, that means we're articulating it like this in this moment in time. Because this has a long, 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 long history, right? Hundreds and certainly hundreds of years. That's, certainly, that's uh that that's a good point. I I conceptualize these uh to um to found it uh for us the this um presently entrenched and I, I realized that as you pointed out uh, to call it an uh, entrenched uh is maybe falling a little bit into the substantialist trap right as it can be uh of course uh de-entrenched uh, so to speak but um but certainly the the post um cold war state of uh, of relations between uh, western and eastern europe is not uh, something that arises out of um, out of nothing right uh, we need to take into account the development of material inequalities um uh, between uh, these um these core areas and these uh, peripheral ones as part of a uh, uh, more complex historical development and that's why also I want to to study this process as a, a, a from a processual uh, point of view as this uh, this process of uh, of entrenching these um, these relations is is a complex process whereby by with every interaction uh, be it economic political um, uh, you name it with every interaction because of these um because of this uh, power imbalance of this inequality in the relation uh with every interaction then this entrenchment deepens mm -hmm. and that's why i problematize the present um state of the relationship because um it uh, essentially by legitimizing this uh, hegemonic narrative by allowing it to govern the uh, policy that is developed uh, within this relationship, then it enables the entrenchment of these uh, inequalities to deepen. And then to really just keep giving voice everywhere to the multiplicities, like the, his the, the localized histories of resisting. What is being resisted? What isn't being resisted? What's being 
and this is again, I'm getting either or, either or, but trying to get into that messiness where this may work for some area and they're going to take that and they're going to resist on something else. Like how do we get down into that, you know, all the messiness. Yeah, it's such an exciting project. It is. Ben, you have your hand up. Um, yes. Yeah, it was just, uh, Rebecca said we were, the conversation is bubbling now and it's kind of happening in my head too. Like I want to just jump in on everything that's being said here. Um, maybe on the on the wicked problem now i i i was just thinking um so like we we usually conceptualize it in a way that um the 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 uniqueness of the uniqueness of this problem is that nobody can agree on even the problem definition itself um and i thought just now it, this whole thing like the integration process is not a wicked problem from the core european side it's actually it's it's pretty straightforward also the solution like you just like we start the political process, then they're integrated, and you know, you know, the material uh, differences go away, and it's like it's all easy, you know. But it's really just the it becomes a wicked problem when you look at it from the from the other side. So from the Western Balkans, for example, that was Victor mentioned, because then it becomes not um, very quickly the problem definition. Actually, we struggle mightily with Monica. You just mentioned there are all these structural forces, right? So it's like in the capitalist structure this becomes this problem because we are exploited. Also the colonial kind of heritage, like we are also being exploited by this colonial uh, master. Then we have the local elites and in, mm. in, uh, especially in Serbia, Victor always talks Port about, um, who actually, you know, they want to benefit from this process, but exploit the, you know, other uh, parts of the population. So now it really becomes this wicked problem. So from the perspective of the, um, you know, the periphery in a way, then you can't put your finger anymore on what is actually creating all these inequalities or what is what is exploiting now. It's just the accumulation of all these things. Um, so I think from that perspective, it's that's where it really becomes wicked. Um, yeah, which again, it matters, you know, which, who are we doing the thinking with? Who's doing the thinking? And then the world uh, emerges in a different way. Yeah, Monica. I was going to say, and yet the narrative, as you say, Ben, kind of simplifies and tells you, oh, it's because you're backward. It's because mm -hmm. you're underdeveloped. That That's it. And then yeah. everyone looks around and is like, oh, yeah, yeah that is the case. Yeah. And, 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 it, and it, done. <laughs> yeah. And we're developing you now, you know, and that's done. Like, right. And that is the issue that that yeah, these narratives, yeah. the ones that you are studying, Victor, um, are are simplifying everything in this abstract mm -hmm. way. And then and then mm -hmm. we're well, here is um, the proof of what we're saying. And 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 that's it. But when we problematize and I'd like to go back to what Rebecca was saying, make it in more of a movement and more of an embodiment as well. That is something that we need to explore, I think, more together in this group in the sense of when we speak about radical relationism is, is that that radicalness is, because at this level when, and when you're studying, Victor, we're thinking about society, states, people, governance, and that's very social science-y and kind of, makes us stop thinking about our embodiment and um just thinking with your body like like i was just reading that actually we think with our whole bodies um and 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 when we do that then and also um make things into actions more um considering as we have also discussed in this in this group that um European languages are very substantialist, whereas uh, it, it's indigenous languages tend to favor more the verbs and the doing and the and the other day I was noticing this even with um, I don't even quite remember what I was thinking about, but I was looking I was thinking about uh, uh, language how it's used in in Spanish in Mexico and it's very movie and very um, uh, uh, dynamic, whereas when we say it in English, is boom, it's there. It's it's a it's a thing, and 
that even that contrast is perhaps what we need to start by doing this we start decolonizing the way in which we produce the knowledge and the thoughts that help us get there um and do it in that more processual and more moving sense because in a way this whole idea that there's a society that's what is that that's attached to state which is again a creation of the colonial order and if we keep thinking in that way then we end up with those essentialist simplistic ways of thinking which just go either or yes no good bad and then oh developed underdeveloped done <laughs> and yeah. right and if we complexify it then we see that within each of these entities or things that we call states or societies there's a multiplicity of states of being some of which are um richer, poorer, with more opportunities, with less opportunities. And then overall, then we say, oh, developed are and then they're developed. And that is what we need to avoid, perhaps. What we need to do is put it in more moving terms, in, in more disaggregated mm. terms. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there is so much potential to really, really fully live this like I did this like uh like mind experiment of just trying to live this like even so this is just to play with what you just said Monica is like some people are poorer some people are richer but actually name the process of like impoverishing like mm -hmm. it's never a thing there's always something that's trying to push someone in some direction and they're trying to push back like the minute we lock and like you said society is constantly changing but there's a politics of where we try and lock it like society's going bad because this is what it should be like trying to lock 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 and I think it's always a fun exercise with our own writing like a creative exercise like write something and then trying to make all those nouns into verbs and start playing with how do we free ourselves from that thinking that comes out of our fingers when we're typing? And freeing yeah, ourselves loving. from that yeah. thinking is decolonizing ourselves. It's a way of rejecting that substantialist, simplistic solution that we go to good, bad. I mean, that's it. We, we can just leave it at that, good, bad, <laughs> right? And then, and then all the classifying that we do but uh, but it's a lot more complex and that's why it's wicked, right? Mm. The moment mm. we stop looking at it as wicked, that's when mm. it's just simplified and, and you yeah. give in. And I've just been reading um, Aileen Morton Robinson's The White Possessive again and just that the logic of possession, the logic mm. that is in naming, and our whole being as academic researchers is we're asked to name and then lay claim. And that has a very particular root in that tight relationship between research and colonization. The work that research has done over the years at the behest of colonizing forces um, and that lay claim to knowledge um, kind of idea. She troubles it in such a powerful way, but... Yeah, you know, I could go on about that for ages. Yeah, thank yeah, just you. Want to add on this, uh, just want to add on this discussion that this is an aspect as well that I uh, problematize a lot in my research because the way that uh, uh, from the from the Western core uh, side, the way that the European integration is presented is uh, extremely uh, substantialist and as it is very uh, prescriptive. Uh, you essentially the way that I see it um, as it is presented in the hegemonic narrative is as if these um, Eastern European states are going to the doctor and uh, getting diagnosed with their underdevelopment right and they are given a prescription of a um, list of uh, policies that they need to implement and then uh, boom you get uh, you get development mm -hmm. which ignores of course the process whereby uh western european societies have uh developed which the is of course through the, uh, 
colonial exploitation of the rest of the world. Uh, whereas the Eastern Europe has been part of this uh, rest of the world, uh, which has uh, uh, which has entrenched these uh, relations of inequality, right? Um, so that's one of the that was one of the things that I want to emphasize that this development narrative is not this uh, simplistic prescriptive and then you'll then you'll become developed and, and modernized right which is unfortunately uh, to this day how this uh, process of overcoming uh, material inequalities is presented by institutions like the EU or the IMF and that um, could go on all day. Which is not just a European process, of course. I just want to say hi to Washak. I see you're joining us. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. And also Serena, if you need to go, it's all right. It's uh, we're, we're, we're undergoing storms of snow here in Canada. <laughs> It's just a, a load of snow came on us. But um, just not to interrupt this very lively conversation we have, and you have like 10 minutes left. So um, uh, it's uh, it's really lovely that you could join us, Washak. And uh, we're basically talking about this. Um, and I what I wanted to add is that it's not just a European process because this kind of thing has happened over and over again. Like this this formula, right, that the IFM has of open your borders and then do a bunch of um, uh, adjust. What do they call them? Structural adjustments or um, uh, 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 privatize everything, stop giving healthcare to people, and this kind of thing. And then boom, you'll be developed. And that have created so many more troubles for people, right? And it's it's documented. It's not just um, the European Union, but it, it, the whole world can talk to this. Oh, thanks for the link, Rebecca. Uh, ben. Yeah, I'll just quickly on this, what I really like about this, a project is that it centers on Eastern Europe. You're absolutely right, Monica, that this is happening kind of everywhere. And uh, I have a feeling that maybe in the core of Europe, there is some sort of understanding that this, you know, language of developing and underdeveloping and so on is, is maybe more harmful than helpful. Mm -hmm. But I feel like there is a lot of, uh, you know, lack of reflexiveness when it comes to exactly this relationship between West and Eastern Europe. You know, Europe might have this understanding, you know, going to the, you know, former colon colonial uh, territories and things like this. Um, but I really like that this points the finger at the direct neighborhood of like an area where the Western Europeans, you know, maybe are already thinking this this process has ended or there is not this inequality, um, though it's very strongly there. Um, so I, I kind of I really like it also from this perspective, too. Mm. Yeah. Totally within Europe, right? Yeah. Which is also thinking about the the pigs. Remember that whole issue with Greece and Italy and Portugal? Again, intramural differences. Yeah. A lot of the uh, narrative as well, I, I might add, is sort of framed in the uh, deep um, capitalist uh, understanding as well. As, um, as as you mentioned, the pigs, it reminded me of the, the Greek debt crisis where you know, a lot of the, um, the land was set on um, essentially a state uh, level of the um, personal responsibility and narrative that is uh, so inherent to capitalism, right? So it adopted this framing of uh, um, if only he's adopted more policies and um, stopped um, spending recklessly, then uh, then this type of situation wouldn't happen right where this ignores the the coloniality of the situation of how western interest um, took hold of um of a uh, lot of crucial aspects of the greek uh, economy and infrastructure which was um ignored during that crisis totally i, I think this is a great case for one of your introductions i think <laughs> to zoom in on the on the debt crisis 
it, you know, mm. it, 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 yet you ex we saw exactly the same thing there. And the language, you know, the hegemonic discourse is, was absolutely horrendous. Like yes. me for, being from Germany where the German politicians led this discourse, it is, it's yeah. absolutely appalling. I'm reminded of the finance minister who said, we have decided that this is not in your interest and you're gonna save now. Like we have decided this for you. It's uh, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, it might and, be really good. Yeah. Within first. Europe, that's the that's the thing. It's it's uh, ah. it's very interesting how it does yeah. happen. That and way. even within the European Union, this time, yeah. not just um, yeah, already in the integration process already happened. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. It may be useful, Victor, to have a look at what those uh, decolonial um, uh, scholars talk with the intramural difference because. Um, and they speak about how, for instance, and there's a lot of this that how you can't really do, since we're talking about decolonizing knowledge, that you cannot do philosophy in Spanish, for example, right? And there's a whole, of course, continent that says what? And now, and now you have to live with it. <laughs> anyway, um, it's, um, yeah. Ah, anyways, any final remarks? It's been a really uh, good discussion here today, tonight. We have six more minutes if anyone wants to uh, add anything or we can also, I can also stop the recording and use them to have a little chat.